Section One of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume One, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section One: Lineage. In the year 1780, Abraham Lincoln, a member of a respectable and well-to-do family in Rockingham County, Virginia, started westward to establish himself in the newly explored country of Kentucky. He entered several large tracts of fertile land and, returning to Virginia, disposed of his property there and, with his wife and five children, went back to Kentucky and settled in Jefferson County. Little is known of this pioneer Lincoln or of his father. Most of the records belonging to that branch of the family were destroyed in the Civil War. Their early orphanage, the wild and illiterate life they led on the frontier, severed their connection with their kindred in the East. This often happened. There are hundreds of families in the West bearing historic names and probably descended from well-known houses in the older states or in England, which by passing through one or two generations of ancestors who could not read or write have lost their continuity with the past as effectually as if a deluge had intervened between the last century and this. Even the patronymic has been frequently distorted beyond recognition by slovenly pronunciation during the years when letters were a lost art and by the phonetic spelling of the first boy in the family who learned the use of the pen. There are Lincolns in Kentucky and Tennessee belonging to the same stock with the president whose names are spelt Lincorn and Lincoln. All that was known of the emigrant Abraham Lincoln by his immediate descendants was that his progenitors, who were Quakers, came from Berks County, Pennsylvania, into Virginia, and there throve and prospered. Footnote. We desire to express our obligations to Edwin Salter, Samuel L. Smedley, Samuel Shackford, Samuel W. Pennypacker, Howard M. Jenkins and John T. Harris, Jr. for information and suggestions which have been of use in this chapter. End footnote. But we now know with sufficient clearness, through the widespread and searching luster which surrounds the name, the history of the migrations of the family since its arrival on the continent and the circumstances under which the Virginia pioneer started for Kentucky. The first ancestor of the line of whom we have knowledge was Samuel Lincoln of Norwich, England, who came to Hingham, Massachusetts, in 1638 and died there. He left a son, Mordecai, whose son of the same name, and it is a name which persists in every branch of the family, removed to Monmouth, New Jersey, and thence to Amity Township, now a part of Berks County, Pennsylvania, where he died in 1735, 50 years old. Footnote. The Lincolns, in naming their children, followed so strict a tradition that great confusion has arisen in the attempt to trace their genealogy. For instance, Abraham Lincoln of Chester County, son of one Mordecai and brother of another, the president's ancestors, left a fair estate by will to his children, whose names were John, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Mordecai, Rebecca, and Sarah, precisely the same names we find in three collateral families. End footnote. From a copy of his will recorded in the office of the register, in inventory of his effects, made after his death, he is styled by the appraisers Mordecai Lincoln, gentleman. His son John received by his father's will a certain piece of land lying in the Jerseys containing three hundred acres, the other sons and daughters having been liberally provided for from the Pennsylvania property. This John Lincoln left New Jersey some years later and about 1750 established himself in Rockingham County, Virginia. He had five sons to whom he gave the names which were traditional in the family, Abraham, the pioneer first mentioned, Isaac, Jacob, Thomas, and John. Jacob and John remained in Virginia. The former was a soldier in the War of the Revolution and took part as lieutenant in a Virginia regiment at the siege of Yorktown. 
Isaac went to a place on the Holston River in Tennessee. Thomas followed his brother to Kentucky, lived and died there, and his children then emigrated to Tennessee. Footnote. It is an interesting coincidence for the knowledge of which we are indebted to Colonel John B. Brownlow that a minister named Mordecai Lincoln, a relative of the President, performed on the 17th of May, 1837, the marriage ceremony of Andrew Johnson, Mr. Lincoln's successor in the presidency. End footnote. With the one memorable exception, the family seemed to have been modest, thrifty, unambitious people. Even the great fame and the conspicuousness of the president did not tempt them out of their retirement. Robert Lincoln of Hancock County, Illinois, a cousin, German, became a captain and commissionary of volunteers. None of the others, so far as we know, ever made their existence known to their powerful kinsmen during the years of his glory. It was many years after the death of the president that his son learned the probable circumstances under which the pioneer Lincoln removed to the West and the intimate relations which subsisted between his family and the most celebrated man in early Western annals. There is little doubt that it was on account of his association with the famous Daniel Boone that Abraham Lincoln went to Kentucky. The families had for a century been closely allied. There were frequent intermarriages among them, both being of Quaker lineage. Footnote, a letter from David J. Lincoln of Birdsboro, Berks County, Pennsylvania, to the writers, says, My grandfather, Abraham Lincoln, was married to Anna Boone, a first cousin of Daniel Boone, July 10, 1760. He was half-brother of John Lincoln, and afterwards became a man of some prominence in Pennsylvania, serving in the Constitutional Convention in 1789-1790. to 1790. End footnote. By the will of Mordecai Lincoln, to which reference has been made, his loving friend and neighbour, George Boone, was made a trustee to assist his widow in the care of the property. Squire Boone, the father of Daniel, was one of the appraisers who made the inventory of Mordecai Lincoln's estate. The intercourse between the families was kept up after the Boones had removed to North Carolina and John Lincoln had gone to Virginia. Abraham Lincoln, son of John and grandfather of the President, was married to Miss Mary Shipley in North Carolina. The inducement which led him to leave Virginia where his standing and his fortune were assured, was in all probability his intimate family relations with the great explorer, the hero of the new country of Kentucky, the land of fabulous richness and unlimited adventure. At a time when the eastern states were ringing with the fame of the mighty hunter who was then in the prime of his manhood and in the midst of those achievements which will forever render him one of the most picturesque heroes in all our annals, it is not to be wondered at that his own circle of friends should have caught the general enthusiasm and felt the desire to emulate his career. Boone's exploration of Kentucky had begun some ten years before Lincoln set out to follow his trail. In 1769 he made his memorable journey to that virgin wilderness, of whose beauty he always loved to speak even to his latest breath. During all that year he hunted, finding everywhere abundance of game. The buffalo, Boone says, were more frequent than I have seen cattle in the settlements, browsing on the leaves of the cane or cropping the herbage on these extensive plains. Fearless because ignorant of the violence of man, sometimes we saw hundreds in a drove and the numbers about the salt springs were amazing. In the course of the winter, however, he was captured by the Indians while hunting with a comrade, and when they had contrived to escape, they never found again any trace of the rest of their party. But a few days later, they saw two men approaching and hailed them with the hunter's caution. Hello, strangers. Who are you? They replied, white men and friends. They proved to be Squire Boone and another adventurer from North Carolina. The younger Boone had made that long pilgrimage through the trackless woods, led by an instinct of dog-like affection to find his elder brother and share his sylvan pleasures and dangers. 
Their two companions were soon waylaid and killed, and the Boones spent their long winter in that mighty solitude undisturbed. In the spring their ammunition, which was to them the only necessary of life, ran low, and one of them must return to the settlements to replenish the stock. It need not be said which assumed this duty. The cadet went uncomplaining on his way, and Daniel spent three months in absolute loneliness, as he himself expressed it, by myself, without bread, salt, or sugar, without company of my fellow creatures, or even a horse or dog. He was not insensible to the dangers of his situation. He never approached his camps without the utmost precaution, and always slept in the cane breaks if the signs were unfavourable. But he makes in his memoirs this curious reflection, which would seem like affectation in one less perfectly and simply heroic. How unhappy such a situation for a man tormented with fear, which is vain if no danger comes, and if it does only augments the pain. It was my happiness to be destitute of this afflicting passion, with which I had the greatest reason to be afflicted. After his brother's return, for a year longer they hunted in those lovely wilds, and then returned to the Yadkin to bring their families to the new domain. They made the long journey back five hundred miles in peace and safety. For some time after this, Boone took no conspicuous part in the settlement of Kentucky. The expedition with which he left the Yadkin in 1773 met with a terrible disaster near Cumberland Gap, in which his eldest son and five more young men were killed by Indians, and the whole party, discouraged by the blow, retired to the safer region of Clinch River. In the meantime, the dauntless speculator, Richard Henderson, had begun his occupation with all the pomp of Vissa royalty. Harrodsburg had been founded, and corn planted, and a flourishing colony established at the falls of the Ohio. In 1774, Boone was called upon by the governor of Virginia to escort a party of surveyors through Kentucky, and on his return was given the command of three garrisons and for several years thereafter the history of the state is the record of his feats and arms. No one ever equalled him in this knowledge of Indian character, and his influence with the savages was a mystery to him and to themselves. Three times he fell into their hands and they did not harm him. Twice they adopted him into their tribes while they were still on the war path. Once they took him to Detroit, to show the long knife chieftains of King George that they also could exhibit trophies of memorable prowess, but they refused to give him up even to their British allies. Footnote Silas Farmer, historiographer of Detroit, informs us that Daniel Boone was brought there on the 10th of March, 1778, and that he remained there a month. End footnote. In no quality of wise woodcraft was he wanting. He could outrun a dog or a deer, he could thread the woods without food day and night. He could find his way as easily as the panther could. Although a great athlete and a tireless warrior, he hated fighting and only fought for peace. In council and in war he was equally valuable. His advice was never rejected without disaster, nor followed but with advantage. And when the fighting once began, there was not a rival in Kentucky which could rival his. At the nine days' siege at Boonesboro, he took deliberate aim and killed a negro renegade who was harassing the garrison from a tree 525 feet away and whose head was only visible from the fort. The mildest and the quietest of men, he had killed dozens of enemies with his own hands and all this without malice and strangest of all without incurring the hatred of his adversaries. He had self-respect enough but not a spark of vanity. After the fatal battle of the Blue Licks, where the only point of light in the day's terrible work was the wisdom and valour with which he had partly retrieved a disaster he foresaw but was powerless to prevent, when it became his duty as senior surviving officer of the forces to report the affair to the Governor Harrison, his dry and naked narrative gives not a single hint of what he had done himself, nor mentions the gallant son lying dead on the field, nor the wounded brother whose gallantry might justly have claimed some notice. He was thinking solely of the public good, saying, 
I have encouraged the people in this country all that I could, but I can no longer justify them or myself to risk our lives here under such extraordinary hazards. He therefore begged His Excellency to take immediate measures for relief. During the short existence of Henderson's legislature, he was a member of it and not the least useful one. Among his measures was one of the protection of game. Everything we know of the emigrant Abraham Lincoln goes to show that it was under the auspices of this most famous of our pioneers that he set out from Rockingham County to make a home for himself and his young family in that wild region which Boone was wrestling from its savage holders. He was not without means of his own. He took with him funds enough to enter an amount of land which would have made his family rich if they had retained it. The county records show him to have been the possessor of a domain of some 1,700 acres. There is still in existence the original warrant dated March 4, 1780 for 400 acres of land for which the pioneer had paid into the public treasury £160 current money and a copy of the surveyor's certificate giving the meets and bounds of the property of Floyd's Fork which remained for many years in the hands of Mordecai Lincoln, the pioneer's eldest son and heir. The name was misspelled Linkhorn by a blunder of the clerk in the land office and the error was perpetuated in the subsequent record. Kentucky had been for many years the country of romance and fable for Virginians. Twenty years before Governor Spotswood had crossed the Allen Garnies and returned to establish in a Williamsburg tavern that fantastic order of nobility which he called the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe and with a worldly wisdom which was scarcely consistent with these medieval affectations to press upon the attention of the british government the building of a line of frontier forts to guard the ohio river from the french many years after him the greatest of all virginians crossed the mountains again and became heavily interested in those schemes of emigration which filled the minds of many of the leading men in america until they were driven out by graver cares and more imperative duties washington had acquired claims and patents to the amount of thirty or forty thousand acres of land in the west benjamin franklin and the lees were also large owners of these speculative titles. They formed, it is true, rather an airy and unsubstantial sort of possession, the same ground being often claimed by a dozen different persons or companies under various grants from the Crown or from legislatures, or through purchase by adventures from Indian councils. But about the time of which we are speaking, the spirit of emigration had reached the lower strata of colonial society, and a steady stream of pioneers began pouring over the passes of the mountains into the green and fertile valleys of Kentucky and Tennessee. They selected their homes in the most eligible spots to which chance or the report of earlier explorers directed them with little knowledge or care as to the rightful ownership of the land and too often cleared their corner of the wilderness for the benefit of others. Even Boone, to whose courage, forest law and singular intuitions of savage character the state of Kentucky owed more than to any other man, was deprived in his old age of his hard-earned homestead through his ignorance of legal forms and removed to Missouri to repeat in that new territory his labours and his misfortunes. The period at which Lincoln came west was one of note in the history of Kentucky. The labours of Henderson and the Transylvania Company had begun to bear fruit in extensive plantations and a connected system of forts. The land laws of Kentucky had reduced to something like order the chaos of conflicting claims arising from the various grants and the different preemption customs under which settlers occupied their property. The victory of Boone at Boonesboro against the Shawnees and the capture of Kaskaskia and Vincennes at the brilliant audacity of George Rogers Clark had brought the region prominently to the attention of the Atlantic states and had turned in that direction the restless and roving spirits which are always found in communities at periods when great emigrations are a need of civilization. 
Up to this time few persons had crossed the mountains except hunters, trappers and explorers, men who came merely to kill game, and possibly Indians, or to spy out the fertility of the land for the purpose of speculation. But in 1780 and 1781 a large number of families took up their line of march, and in the latter year a considerable contingent of women joined the little army of pioneers, impelled by an instinct which they themselves probably but half comprehended. The country was to be peopled, and there was no other way of peopling it but by the sacrifice of many lives and fortunes, and the history of every country shows that these are never lacking when they are wanted. The number of those who came at about the same time with the pioneer Lincoln was sufficient to lay the basis of a sort of social order. Early in the year 1780, three hundred large family boats arrived at the falls of the Ohio, where the land had been surveyed by Captain Bullitt seven years before, and in May the legislature of Virginia passed a law for the incorporation of the town of Louisville, then containing some six hundred inhabitants. At the same session a law was passed confiscating the property of certain British subjects for the endowment of an institution of learning in Kentucky, it being the interest of this commonwealth, to quote the language of the philosophic legislature, always to encourage and promote every design which may lead to the improvement of the mind and the diffusion of useful knowledge even among its remote citizens, whose situation in a barbarous neighbourhood and a savage intercourse might otherwise render them unfriendly to science. This was the origin of the Transylvania University of Lexington, which rose and flourished for many years on the utmost verge of civilization. The barbarous neighbourhood and the savage intercourse undoubtedly had their effect upon the manners and morals of the settlers, but we should fall into error if we took it for granted that the pioneers were all of one piece. The ruling motive which led most of them to the wilds was that Anglo-Saxon lust of land which seemed inseparable from the race. The prospect of possessing a four hundred acre farm by merely occupying it, and the privilege of exchanging a basket full of almost worthless continental currency for an unlimited estate at the nominal value of forty cents per acre, were irresistible to thousands of land loving Virginians and Carolinians whose ambition of proprietorship was larger than their means. Accompanying this flood of emigrants of good faith was the usual froth and scum of shiftless idlers and adventurers who were either drifting with the current they were too worthless to withstand or in pursuit of dishonest gains in fresher and simpler regions. The vices and virtues of the pioneers were such as proceeded from their environment. They were careless of human life because life was worth comparatively little in that hard struggle for existence, but they had a remarkably clear idea of the value of property and visited theft not only with condign punishment but also with the severest social proscription. Stealing a horse was punished more swiftly and with more feeling than homicide. A man might be replaced more easily than the other animal. Sloth was the worst of weaknesses. An habitual drunkard was more welcome at raisings and log rollings than a known feinant. The man who did not do a man's share where work was to be done was christened Lazy Lawrence, and that was the end of him socially. Cowardice was punished by inexorable disgrace. The point of honour was as strictly observed as it ever has been in the idlest and most artificial society. If a man accused another of falsehood, the ordeal by fisticuffs was instantly resorted to. Weapons were rarely employed in these chivalrous encounters, being kept for more serious use with Indians and wild beasts. Nevertheless, fists, teeth and the gorging thumb were often employed with fatal effect. Yet among this rude and uncouth people there was a genuine and remarkable respect for law. They seemed to recognise it as an absolute necessity of their existence. In the territory of Kentucky and afterwards in that of Illinois, it occurred at several periods in the transition from counties to territories and states that the country was without any organised authority. But the people were a law unto themselves. 
their improvised courts and councils administered law and equality contracts were enforced debts were collected and a sort of order was maintained it may be said generally that the character of this people was far more above their circumstances and all the accessories of life by which we are accustomed to rate communities and races in the scale of civilization they were little removed from primitive barbarism they dressed in the skins of wild beasts killed by themselves and in linen stuffs woven by themselves they hardly knew the use of iron except in their firearms and knives their food consisted almost exclusively of game fish and roughly ground corn meal their exchanges were made by barter many a child grew up without ever seeing a piece of money their habitations were hardly superior to those of the savages with whom they wage constant war large families lived in log huts put together without iron and far more open to the inclemencies of the skies than the pigsties of the careful farmer of to-day an early schoolmaster says that the first place where he went to board was the house of one lucas consisting of a single room sixteen feet square and tenanted by mr and mrs lucas ten children three dogs two cats and himself there were many who lived in hovels so cold that they had to sleep on their shoes to keep them from freezing too stiff to be put on the children grew inured to misery like this and played barefoot in the snow it is an error to suppose that all this could be undergone with impunity they suffered terribly from malarial and rheumatic complaints and the instances of vigorous and painless age were rare among them the lack of moral and mental sustenance was still more marked they were inclined to be a religious people but a sermon was an unusual luxury one to be enjoyed at long intervals and by great expense of time there were few books or none and there was little opportunity for the exchange of opinion any variation in the dreary course of events was welcome a murder was not without its advantages as a stimulus to conversation a criminal trial was a kind of holiday to a county it was this poverty of life this famine of social gratification from which sprang their fondness for the grosser forms of excitement and their tendency to rough and brutal practical joking in a life like theirs a laugh seemed worth having at any expense but near as they were to barbarism in all the circumstances of their daily existence they were far from it politically they were the children of a race which had been trained in government for centuries in the best school the world had ever seen, and wherever they went they formed the town, the county, the court, and the legislative power with the ease and certainty of nature evolving its results, and this they accomplished in the face of a savage foe surrounding their feeble settlements, always alert and hostile, invisible and dreadful, as the visionary powers of the air until the treaty of greenville in seventeen ninety five closed the long and sanguinary history of the old indian wars there was no day in which the pioneer could leave his cabin with the certainty of not finding it in ashes when he returned and his little flock murdered on his threshold or carried into a captivity worse than death whenever nightfall came with the man of the house away from home the anxiety and care of the women and children were none the less bitter because so common the life of the pioneer abraham lincoln soon came to a disastrous close he had settled in jefferson county on the land he had bought from the government and cleared a small farm in the forest footnote lyman c draper of the wisconsin historical society has kindly furnished us with the m s account of a kentucky tradition according to which the pioneer abraham lincoln was captured by the indians near crow station in august seventeen eighty two carried into captivity and forced to run the gauntlet the story rests on the statement of a single person mrs sarah graham End footnote one morning in the year 1784 he started with his three sons mordecai josiah and thomas to the edge of the clearing and began the day's work a shot from the bush killed the father mordecai the eldest son ran instinctively to the house josiah to the neighbouring fort for assistance and thomas the youngest a child of six was left with the corpse of his father 
Mordecai, reaching the cabin, seized the rifle and saw through the loophole an Indian in his war paint stooping to raise the child from the ground. He took deliberate aim at a white ornament on the breast of the savage and brought him down. The little boy, thus released, ran to the cabin, and Mordecai from the loft renewed his fire upon the savages, who began to show themselves from the thicket until Josiah returned with assistance from the stockade and the assailants fled. This tragedy made an indelible impression on the mind of Mordecai, either a spirit of revenge for his murdered father or a sportsman-like pleasure in his successful shot, made him a determined Indian stalker, and he rarely stopped to inquire whether the red man who came within the range of his rifle was friendly or hostile. Footnote. Late in life, Mordecai Lincoln removed to Hancock County, Illinois, where his descendants still live. End footnote. The head of the family being gone, the widow Lincoln soon removed to a more thickly settled neighborhood in Washington County. There her children grew up. Mordecai and Josiah became reputable citizens. The two daughters married two men named Croom and Brumfield. Thomas, to whom were reserved the honors of an illustrious paternity, learned the trade of a carpenter. He was an easy-going man entirely without ambition, but not without self-respect. Though the friendliest and most jovial of gossips, he was not insensible to affronts, and when his slow anger was roused, he was formidable adversary. Several border bullies at different times crowded him indiscreetly and were promptly and thoroughly whipped. He was strong, well-knit, and sinewy, but little over the medium height, though in other respects he seems to have resembled his son in appearance. On the 12th of June, 1806, while learning his trade in the carpenter shop of Joseph Hanks in Elizabethtown, he married Nancy Hanks, a niece of his employer, near Beachland in Washington County. Footnote. All previous accounts give the date of this marriage as September 23rd. This error arose from a clerical blunder in the county record of marriages. The minister, the Reverend Jesse Head, in making his report, wrote the date before the names. The clerk, copying it, lost the proper sequence of the entries and gave to the Lincolns the date belonging to the next couple on the list. End footnote. She was one of a large family who had emigrated from Virginia with the Lincolns and with another family called Sparrow. They had endured together the trials of pioneer life. Their close relations continued for many years after and were cemented by frequent intermarriage. Mrs. Lincoln's mother was named Lucy Hanks. Her sisters were Betty, Polly, and Nancy, who married Thomas Sparrow, Jesse Friend, and Levy Hall. The childhood of Nancy was passed with the Sparrows, and she was oftener called by their name than by her own. The whole family connection was composed of people so little given to letters that it is hard to determine the proper names and relationships of the younger members amid the tangle of traditional cousinships. Footnote. The Hanks family seem to have gone from Pennsylvania and thence to Kentucky, about the same time with the Lincolns. They also belonged to the communion of friends. Historical Collections of Gwynedd by H. M. Jenkins End footnote. Those who went to Indiana with Thomas Lincoln and grew up with his children are the ones that need demand our attention. There was no hint of future glory in the wedding or the bringing home of Nancy Lincoln. All accounts represent her as a handsome young woman of twenty-three, of appearance and intellect superior to her lowly fortunes. She could read and write, a remarkable accomplishment in her circle, and even taught her husband to form the letters of his name. He had no such valuable wedding gift to bestow upon her. He brought her down to a little house in Elizabethtown, where he and she and Want dwelt together in fourteen feet square. The next year a daughter was born to them, and the next the young carpenter, not finding his work remunerative enough for his growing needs, removed to a little farm which he had brought on the easy terms then prevalent in Kentucky. 
It was on the big south fork of Nolan Creek, in what was then Hardin and is now La Rue country, three miles from Hodgenville. The ground had nothing attractive about it but cheapness. It was hardly more grateful than the rocky hill slopes of New England. It required full as earnest and intelligent industry to persuade a living out of those barren hillocks and weedy hollows, covered with stunted and scrubby underbrush, as it would amid the rocks and sands of the northern coast. Thomas Lincoln settled down in this dismal solitude to a deeper poverty than any of his name had ever known, and there, in the midst of the most unpromising circumstances that ever witnessed the advent of a hero into this world, Abraham Lincoln was born on the twelfth day of February, 1809. Four years later, Thomas Lincoln purchased a fine farm of 238 acres on Knob Creek, near where it flows into the Rolling Fork, and succeeded in getting a portion of it into cultivation. The title, however, remained in him only a little while, and after his property had passed out of his control, he looked about for another place to establish himself. Of all these years of Abraham Lincoln's early childhood, we know almost nothing. He lived a solitary life in the woods, returning from his lonesome little games to his cheerless home. He never talked of these days to his most intimate friends. Once, when asked what he remembered about the war with Great Britain, he replied, Nothing but this. I had been fishing one day and caught a little fish which I was taking home. I met a soldier in the road and having been always told at home that we must be good to the soldiers, I gave him my fish. This is only a faint glimpse, but what it shows is rather pleasant, the generous child and the patriotic household. But there is no question that these first years of his life had their lasting effect upon the temperament of this great mirthful and melancholy man. He had little schooling. He accompanied his sister Sarah, to the only school that existed in their neighbourhood, one kept by Zachariah Riney, another by Caleb Hazel, where he learned his alphabet and a little more. Footnote. The daughter of Thomas Lincoln is sometimes called Nancy and sometimes Sarah. She seems to have been born the former name during her mother's lifetime and to have taken her stepmother's name after Mr. Lincoln's second marriage. End footnote. But of all those advantages for the cultivation of a young mind and spirit which every home now offers to its children, the books, toys, ingenious games and daily devotion of parental love, he knew absolutely nothing. Relocated footnote. Soon after Mr. Lincoln arrived in Washington in 1861, he received the following letter from one of his Virginia kinsmen, the last communication which ever came from them. It was written on paper, adorned with a portrait of Jefferson Davis, and was enclosed in an envelope emblazoned with the Confederate flag. To Abraham Lincoln, Esquire, President of the Northern Confederacy. Sir, having just returned from a trip through Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, permit me to inform you that you will get whipped out of your boots. Today I met a gentleman from Anna, Illinois, and although he voted for you, he says that the moment your troops leave Cairo, they will get the spots knocked out of them. My dear sir, these are facts which time will prove to be correct. I am, sir, with every consideration, yours respectfully, Minor Lincoln, of the Staunton Stocks of Lincolns. There was a young Abraham Lincoln on the Confederate site, in the Shenandoah, distinguished for his courage and ferocity, he lay in wait and shot a drunkard preacher whom he suspected of furnishing information to the Union Army. Letter from Samuel W. Pennypacker. End footnote. Relocated footnote. In giving to the wife of the pioneer Lincoln the name of Mary Shipley, we follow the tradition in his family. The Honourable J. L. Knoll of Misery, grandson of Nancy Brumfield, Abraham Lincoln's youngest child, has given us so clearly a statement of the case that we cannot hesitate to accept it, although it conflicts with equally positive statements from other sources. 
The late Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, who gave much intelligent effort to genealogical researches, was convinced that the Abraham Lincoln who married Miss Hannah Winters, a daughter of Anne Boone, sister of the famous Daniel, was the President's grandfather. Waddell's Annals of Augusta County says he married Elizabeth Winter, a cousin of Daniel Boone. The Boone and Lincoln families were large, and there were frequent intermarriages among them, and the patriarchal name of Abraham was a favourite one. There was still another Lincoln, Hananiah by name, who was also intimately associated with the Boones. His signature appears on the surveyor's certificate for Abraham Lincoln's land in Jefferson County, and he joined Daniel Boone in 1798 in the purchase of the tract of land on the Missouri River, where Boone died. Letter from Richard V. B. Lincoln, printed in the Williamsport Banner, February 25th, 1881. End footnote. Relocated footnote. In the possession of Colonel Reuben T. Durrett of Louisville, a gentleman who has made the early history of his state a subject of careful study, and to whom we are greatly indebted for information in regard to the settlement of the Lincolns in Kentucky. He gives the following list of lands in the state owned by Abraham Lincoln. 1. 400 acres on Long Run, a branch of Floyd's Fork in Jefferson County, entered May 29, 1780, and surveyed May 7, 1785. We have in our possession the original patent issued by Governor Garrard of Kentucky to Abraham Lincoln for this property. It was founded by Colonel A. C. Matthews of the 99th Illinois in 1863 at an abandoned residence near Indianola, Texas. 2. 800 acres on Green River near Green River Lick entered June 7, 1780 and surveyed October 12, 1784. 3. 500 acres in Campbell County, date of entry not known, but surveyed September 27, 1798 and patented June 30, 1799 the survey and patent evidently following his entry after his death. It is possible that this was the 500-acre tract found in Boone's field book in the possession of Lyman C. Draper, Esquire, Secretary of the Wisconsin Historical Society, and erroneously supposed by some to have been in Mercer County. Boone was a deputy of Colonel Thomas Marshall, surveyor of Fayette County. End footnote. Relocated footnote. The following is a copy of the marriage bond. Know all men by these presents. That we, Thomas Lincoln and Richard Berry, are held and firmly bound unto His Excellency, the Governor of Kentucky, in that just and full sum of fifty pounds current money to the payment of which well and truly to be made to the said governor and his successors we bind ourselves our heirs etc jointly and severally firmly by these presents sealed with our seals and dated this tenth day of june eighteen o six the conditions of the above obligation is such that whereas there is a marriage shortly intended between the above bound thomas lincoln and nancy hanks for which a license has issued now, if there be no lawful cause to obstruct the said marriage, then this obligation to be void, else to remain in full force and virtue in the law. Thomas Lincoln, seal. Richard Berry, seal. Witness, John H. Parrott, guardian. Richard Berry was a connection of Lincoln. His wife was a Shipley. End footnote. Relocated footnote. There is still living, 1886, near Knob Creek in Kentucky, at the age of 80, a man who claims to have known Abraham Lincoln in his childhood, Austin Golliher. He says he used to play with Abe Lincoln in the shavings of his father's carpenter shop. He tells us a story which, if accurate, entitles him to the civic crown which the Romans used to give to one who saved the life of a citizen. When Golliher was eleven and Lincoln eight, the two boys were in the woods in pursuit of partridges. 
In trying to coon across Knob Creek on a log, Lincoln fell in and Gollaher fished him out with a sycamore branch, a service to the Republic, the value of which it would be difficult to compute. End footnote. End of section one.